How do you feel when uh, maybe, uh, for those of you who are married, or, or you don't have to be married, but uh, just going through something in your life, and you're having an argument with your spouse, with your friend, and you realize that you're kind of wrong, but you don't want to admit you're wrong. You ever been there? Like, maybe when you started the discussion, you were, oh, I've got my reasons. And then as you have the discussion, you start thinking, maybe the Holy Spirit's talking to you, and wait, wait, I shouldn't be upset. I shouldn't be angry. And God's taking these away, but you don't want to admit it. You just want to stay stubborn, stubborn in, in your wrongness. Isn't that a shame? That's a real shame, because where is the blessing? The blessing comes when we come to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm wrong. When we, when we confess, the Bible says times of repenting, uh, when we repent, times of uh, refreshing come. So in order to receive the blessing, we have to have the spiritual maturity to say, I was wrong, I was out of line, I made a mistake, I was out of order, I should not have said this, I should not have done that. And then that's when the Lord blesses us. And yet, our sin nature rebels against that. We don't want to admit that we, we erred in some way. We want to build up our defenses and, and dig down. You know, you're, you're digging your own grave. We've all heard of that phrase, right? Brothers and sisters, God's way is better than my way. God's way is better than, than your way. God has, has goodness in store for us, and we have to Everybody there? We have to uh, be willing to humble ourselves and confess and come clean with the Lord. So, brothers and sisters, what's not working for you? What's not working? Something the way we're doing our lives. What's not working in the way we're, we're thinking or our attitudes? What's not working in the way we're... Uh, our attitude towards our jobs, or our attitude towards our, our school or our classmates, or our attitude towards authority. What, what is in, in our hearts causing us to have some disruption, some bitterness, some, some darkness, some divide? The Bible says that a root of bitterness grows up and it defiles many. Let a little bit of bitterness get into our heart. Not only are our own souls ruined, but pretty soon we're poisoned to everyone around us. And all the while, God's way is better. God's way is better. It's beautiful. Today's message is when being sorry isn't good enough. When being sorry isn't good enough. Well, I thought this is a church, and if I say I'm sorry, everything's... Well, no. In fact, there's a big difference between remorse and repentance. Do not settle for remorse because the devil loves that. There, there are plenty of people all over the world say, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm so nasty. I'm sorry for my anger. I'm sorry for my bitterness. I'm sorry I'm just like this. And I'm not going to change. That's who I am. Uh, being, being, being torn up inside, messed up, feeling miserable because of our choices is not the same as repentance. And brothers and sisters, this is important not only for ourselves, this is important when you're talking with, with people that maybe don't know the Lord yet. Because I've seen people say, well, they feel really bad that they did something wrong, so I think they're saved. And that's not the same. There's a difference between feeling really bad about what you've done and falling at the feet of Jesus and saying, I love you. Your ways are better. I want to be like you. I want to follow after you. You don't need to have any relationship with God to feel like, wow. I really screwed up my life. I'm miserable. That's, that, see, you can feel bad about your choices and not actually surrender your heart to Jesus Christ. Is everybody tracking? Does that make sense? Are you following with that? All right, Matthew chapter 27, 1 through 10. There's a couple of controversies in this passage, and I'm going to spend just a literally little time with them because I don't think they should be controversies, and they're kind of a distraction. Uh, from verse 1. Everybody there? Matthew 27. 
early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. Now, Pilate would normally be in Caesarea, but because of Passover, probably, he's, uh, he's in Jerusalem to keep a, a close eye on everything to make sure there's not trouble. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver the chief priest, the, uh, to the chief priests and the elders. So Judas, maybe, uh, I don't know what he was thinking. There's a theory out there that there may be some truth to that Jesus was trying to force, I mean, that Judas was trying to force Jesus' hand. He had seen the miracles that Jesus did. He wanted to push Jesus to declare an earthly kingdom or push Jesus to fight the Roman Empire. Uh, and so maybe he was trying to set up things. Uh, that's a possibility because when he sees that Jesus now is captured and facing the death penalty, now he's repented. He's, he's, I should say he's remorseful. I don't know if that theory is true or not. Some people really stand by it. I kind of have some, uh, some questions, but uh, uh, either way, uh, Judas now is uh, feeling really bad about what he did. So he takes the 30 pieces of silver, and he brings them back to the priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned, for I have betrayed innocent blood. Now, what does he do? He feels bad about what he's done, and now he's even admitting this was not God's way. I have sinned. To sin means to transgress, to turn away from God's holy law. So he knew what God wanted, and he knew he did the opposite. He knew he was sinful. So he goes to these religious leaders. He goes to the temple and said, I sinned. I betrayed innocent blood. And these great religious leaders say, what is that to us? That's your responsibility. What a horrible thing. And I wonder how, uh, how that angered God. For, uh, for somebody to come and say, I've sinned. I, I, I'm remorseful. I'm, I, I, I feel so bad about what I've done. And come to a place where they should have heard the truth of God. And the religious leaders say, that's your responsibility. We don't care. We don't care. You did that. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. So now he doesn't even want to profit from what he's done. So not only... Is he sorrowful? Now he's uh, not only is he sorrowful, he also knows it's sin. And not only does he know it's sin, he doesn't want to profit from it anymore. So many times when we're stuck in a sin rut, we still want to profit from it. We still want to get something out of it. But he's done with it. He throws it into the temple and he leaves. Then he went away and he hanged himself. Now, this is part of the controversy here in that uh, Acts tells us that. His uh, stomach gushed out on the ground. Uh, here it says he hung himself. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, here's a cute, no, I don't know, it's cute. This is not cute. This, <laughs> this is not even cute at all. I was about to talk about demon possession. Can you believe that? I never started a conversation of demon possession in my life by saying this is cute. Uh, this is a view that some of the old time Christians had, not only in the Catholic Church, but it came over to the the Protestant church and, and Lightfoot and others were a proponent of this. They thought that Satan, in anger, uh, seized Judas, threw him up into the air, uh, strangled him, and th crashed him on the ground. The problem with that is there's nothing in the text to make us think that that's what happened. Uh, the word here for hang is not necessarily hung by a rope, but suffocated or, or his breathing constricted. So other people say maybe he was sobbing and choked with remorse and jumped off a cliff and burst his bowels on the ground. Uh, the traditional way of looking at it, because to, for it to be a contradiction, it means that the two have to be contradictory at the same time and in the same sense. And if they're not, then it's not a necessary contradiction. So another way of looking at this is that uh, he went to hang himself uh, he, he may be uh, the rope broke or the branch broke or the tree fell over and he crashed onto the ground and his entrails fell out. Or that he did hang himself and, and Matthew is talking about uh, this is how he died in, in, in Luke, uh, in, in Acts. Luke is just saying this nasty guy went and he went to the field and his bowels were scattered over there. Meaning he skipped the part about hanging himself but this is the nasty end. He hung there and rotted and when he fell the bowels went everywhere. The other thing is maybe he impaled himself on sharp or jagged rocks or, or uh, branches when he jumped down into something. And so he's constricted his breathing and he cut himself open that way. I mean, there are so many different ways. It's not like we have to have a big hang up about this, but that's where that is. 
Uh, so he threw the money into the temple, and he went away and hung himself. The chief priests picked up the coins and said, now they're getting real spiritual, really holy. It's against the law to put uh, this into the treasury since it's blood money. So the same guys who turned their backs on somebody who was in despair over what they had done, now they're going to really obey the minute detail of the law here and say, we can't use this blood money in the temple. That would be unrighteous. That would be unholy. So much religion and no God. Brothers and sisters, we're fully capable of that today, to have a lot of religion and no Jesus. We need to be more like Jesus Christ. More like Jesus Christ. So the, chiefs pick, uh, the chief priest picked up the coins and said, it's against the law to put this into the treasury since it's blood money. So he decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why, to this day, it's been called the field of blood. Uh, then this was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. It's actually alluded to in Jeremiah and also in another passage in the Old Testament. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them, uh, the money to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Uh, in, in the book of Acts, it says that uh, uh, Judas, it doesn't even use Judas' name, but he said this guy, uh, he bought that money with his guts on the field. He, and so, so Matthew is saying technically he threw the money into the temple and then the uh, priest bought the field with that money. Where in, in Acts, uh, he's talking about here he, he, went, he, he was filled with sorrow. He went, he threw himself on there, his, his guts bought out and he bought that money with his, with his guts and his, with his blood and now uh, that's why it's called the field of blood. So some people think that's a contradiction. I think one is talking about the actual way it was purchased and the other one was talking more poetically. That's how that field was bought with his life, you know scattered out over the ground. But that is a reason why some people say, see, uh, this is one of the contradictions in the Bible. It, it can't, uh, can't be held up. Uh, look at what happened now to, uh, I want you to contrast this with Peter. Does everybody remember what just happened to Peter? Remember he told Jesus, no matter what happens, I'm never going to deny you. And Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Remember that? And, and when, the, when the mob comes to grab Jesus where he's praying, uh, Peter takes out a sword and he cuts the ear of the high priest, cuts it right off, and, and he was going to fight for Jesus right there. Jesus said, we're not going to do it this way. I could bring down entire legions of angels at my command. We're not going to do this way. Put away your sword. Peter puts away his sword and he runs into the darkness. But he follows Jesus at a distance. He's seeing Jesus mocked and being beaten and being spit upon and, and he sees it, this, this fake trial that, that should not even be held. He, he goes there and he's watching this uh, fake trial. He's in the courtyard. A group of people have gathered. And as he's watching, warn himself by the fire at night, people start to come up to him and say, wait, I can tell by your accent that you're not from Jerusalem. You're from Galilee. You're, you're one of the followers of Jesus, right? He says, no. And again, they come up to him. You know, you're a follower of Jesus. We know it. And, and we've seen you with him. Finally, the third time, he, he starts call, calling down curses. He's swearing, I do not know this man. And the rooster crows, and it just hits him. I betrayed the man who loves me most. I betrayed the man who's invested his life into me. And he runs away, and he's so overwhelmed. He falls down on the crown. He weeps bitter tears, just bitter tears. His whole soul, he's aching. He's filled with sorrow. He, he feels in utter despair. Well, after the resurrection, Jesus Christ comes, and the Bible tells us that he spoke specifically to Peter. It doesn't tell us what he said uh, in its entirety. Isn't that beautiful? Instead, he reinstates Paul, Peter. He tells him that I want you to be a shepherd of my people, uh, feed my sheep. And, and he said, Jesus says, do you love me? Peter said, I love you. He asked me a second time, do you love me? He asked him three times so that he could three times say, I love you, I love you. Third time he says, you know I love you. You know my heart. Do, do I love you? You know? And, and Jesus gives him a purpose and mission. He reinstates him. Look at the difference. Judas ran away. He ran into darkness and killed himself. Peter ran away. And when the Lord reached out to him, he responded. He responded. Have you ever messed up? Are you going to keep running? Or are you going to turn to Jesus? There's such a world of difference. Both ways people have tears, right? Both ways people are just sick of what they did. But this way leads to darkness. Oh, I'm such a miserable person. I'm, I'm so bad. And, and it's just you beat yourself and beat yourself and, and you kill yourself mentally, spiritually, uh, sometimes physically. 
It's just utter despair and darkness and never, never turning your eyes to the cross. Jesus Christ already paid for all that sin. Over here is, is an honest appraisal of myself. I messed up. I should not have said what I said. I should not have done what I did. I should not have even had these thoughts. And I'm not going to defend them anymore. Lord, I need forgiveness. Lord, I need that grace. I need what you did for me on the cross. Jesus loves you. Are you going to take the grace? Jesus died for your sin. Are you going to take the forgiveness? I'm getting worked up. Settle down. <laughs> it's just uh, it's this huge contrast between Peter and Judas. And in our own lives, when we, when we know that we're going the wrong direction, are we just going to wallow in misery? It, you know, we're all going to wallow. I want to wallow in grace. Everywhere I look, in front of me, there's God's grace. Behind me, there's God's grace. Above me, below me, everywhere. And yeah, I'm a sinner. Yes, I messed up. Yes, and, and Jesus Christ loves me anyways. And I'm going to get back up, and I want to live for him. I don't want to live in that, in that uh, anger, in that bitterness, in that filth anymore, because his ways are better than my ways. And, and, and everything about him is good and beautiful, and I can't say the same for myself. So I want to follow after him. And I've got grace all around me. And the alternative is either you're going to feel anger and bitterness toward yourself and beat yourself up all the time and I'm such a bad person, I never get anything right, what's wrong with me? Or you're going to be very, very skilled at being self-righteous. You're going to find yourself a perch so you can look down at all the other, at the other, well, not all the other because you're up here, but those people down there that are sinners. And you're going to insulate yourself from, from the truth. And you're going to make an excuse and a justification for every wrong, hard-hearted attitude that we have. And those are the only two options when we turn our back to the light. When we turn away from Jesus Christ, we run into the darkness, and then we end up with our guts being spilled all over the field, figuratively speaking. Those are the two options. Uh, that is, that's messed up. That is really messed up. And the sad thing is, is we have such a loving God He's called God, listen, God wants to forgive you. Wait, you don't understand, Pastor. I did the same thing again. No, you don't understand. Jesus said that we should forgive again and again and again. If the person keeps coming to you and asking for forgiveness, Jesus said you forgive them. Guess what? Guess what? God's, that, actually, God's the one who does it right. Exactly. When you've messed up, and you don't want to tell God you're sorry, and you don't want to turn your back on your sin, you don't want to, because I've did it before, I've did it before. That is not the Holy Spirit telling you, don't go to Jesus. That's not the Holy Spirit saying, you don't want to confess the same thing again, do you? That's not the Holy Spirit who says, God's sick of you. That's not the Holy Spirit who says, you're such a screw-up, it, ju it just hurts too bad to see the light. Jesus is saying, come to me, my burden is light. Come to me, I will forgive. God is offering us this beautiful fellowship and relationship with him. And when we mess up, he's still there. And when we turn our backs on him, he's still there. Let's turn to Jesus. Let's turn to Jesus and walk in that goodness and in that beauty and in that forgiveness. Walking in forgiveness is better than walking in condemnation. I don't know if I can prove that scientifically. I'm just saying it. Walking in forgiveness is better than walking in condemnation. Beat yourself up, mess yourself over, leap off a cliff and disembowel yourself. And that pleases nobody in heaven. Heaven doesn't look down and applaud. Heaven, the moment you turn back to Jesus, heaven rejoices. Again and again and again, and again and again and again. And you think, oh my goodness, I still need grace. Get over yourself. You're always going to need grace until you die and are made perfect in heaven. You need grace. Now go and be a person of grace and start giving grace to the people around us, right? What a better world this would be if we had grace for one another. Forgiveness, mercy. 
I asked each of the people being baptized for a favorite verse, and Adam chose one of mine. Well, Adam actually was teasing me this week because he thinks I always have a favorite verse every week, and he's probably right. But uh, one of my many favorite verses, Adam chose Jeremiah 17, 9, and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? When Jesus Christ gave his life for you and saved you, he gave you a new life. Our old self is messed up. It's destined for death. The old man, not going to be ch saved. God gives us a new man, a new life. And in verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward a man according to his contact, uh, conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. The heart is deceitful above all things. The Disney film that's always telling you just follow your heart, the guy who's just saying we've got to make a gut decision, they are contradicting the living, holy word of God. Okay? My gut leads me to some bad decisions. Ugh! I just got to follow. I got to be true to myself. No, you don't. You know that part of you that loves Jesus? How about you be true to that part? Instead of, uh, well, I just, I'm angry and I can't hold it in. I have to be honest and I have to just bring hell into the lives of everybody around me. But wait, there's a part of me that wants to bring heaven into the lives of people around me. I'm going to be true to that part of myself. See, it's not being a hypocrite. It, you think you're being a hypocrite or you think you're just holding it in when you don't make life miserable for everybody? Well, if both parts of our heart are true, why don't we follow the light? I'm, that makes sense to me. I don't always do it. It makes sense to me. Does that make sense to everybody? Some people, doesn't make sense? Yes, it makes sense? Yeah, thank you. Let's, let's follow what Jesus Christ has for us, let's follow the light. Repent, not just feel bad about ourselves or, or admit we make bad choices. You, you ever see people say that? Uh, yeah, I'm an alcoholic, but this is just the way I am. Or yeah, I fight, but that's because of the way I was raised. Or, or yeah, I'm, I'm bitter, but I can't help. That's, you're admitting your bad choices, but that's not the same repentance. Repentance, remember, is like that U-turn. Like I'm, I'm, I wanted to go to Chicago, but I'm on the road to Madison. Repentance means i got to turn around. It doesn't help for me to be driving and say, oh, I'm such a screw-up. I just hate myself for driving the wrong direction. What is wrong with me driving the wrong direction? There's an off-road there, and oh, yeah. Go, go past that. Oh, there was another off-road problem there. Oh, yeah, I just, I'm so nasty. I'm going all the way. You know? I want to be in Chicago, but I'm going to Madison. <laughs> Repentance means saying, God, your ways are right, my ways are wrong, and by your grace... I want to follow you as best as I can. When I stumble, I've got your grace, but I see that off-ramp, and I'm going to take it. I'm going to take the off-ramp, because I don't want to go to Madison. Sorry, everybody from Madison. Beautiful town. <laughs> Turn to God. Uh, in Greek, repent means to change our mind or purpose. Purpose. What was my purpose in life to feed my flesh? What my, my purpose in life? Well, I'm going to wallow in how, how I've messed up. What's my purpose in life? Well, I just have to make myself number one. What's my purpose? Repent. Repent. Now my purpose is Jesus Christ. Now my purpose is the cross. And I don't want to say things. I don't want to do things. I don't want to be somebody that makes it hard for other people to see the cross of Christ. My purpose is to help people find the same love that I found in God. My purpose is to help other people say, you can be forgiven of anything. You can be forgiven of everything. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Make that U-turn. Get back to God. When, Ju when Judas was filled with regret and confessed that he was guilty of praying, betraying Jesus, at that point, it was not too late for him. He saw his sin. And he ran deeper into darkness. We see our sin. Brothers and sisters, you're suck, still sucking air because you're here this morning. It's not too late. It is not too late for anybody who's watching this on the internet or on television. It's not too late. Turn to Jesus. Make that U-turn. Say, God, your ways are better than me, my ways. 
Everything about you is good. I want to be more like you. I'm going, to t- I'm going to say no to myself and yes to you. But instead of running to Jesus and falling down on his knees before him, and we would have a beautiful story in the Bible if he had, instead of doing that and asking for forgiveness and accepting God's love, he chooses to run away from God. Brothers and sisters, haven't we done that before? All of you know prayer works. I promise you. I don't know if prayer works, Pastor. Yes, you do. You know it. Because last time when you were arguing with your wife, you didn't want to pray, did you? Because you knew God was going to fix your attitude. You know prayer works. You know it. Don't run from God. Run to God. Sometimes people say, I can't be in church right now because I screwed up. I can't be at church right now because so many things going on. I'm, I'm such a difficult situation. Don't run from God. Run to God. Run to Jesus. Where do you go? Where is your place when you know you're wrong, when you're just sick of yourself? Where do you go? The local tavern. Where do you, where do you go? Uh, do you just get defensive? Where do you go? Do you start turning the attention to other people so you can point out all that's wrong with them as an excuse for yourself? Do you double down? Do you hide behind your work? Do you just try to be busy all the time? Do you just turn on the television to drown your mind? Is it video games? Is it a bottle? We should be running to Jesus at those times, not away from Jesus. When life is hard, don't tell me I can't be in church because life is hard. That's you need Jesus. Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. I'm saying it again and again and again so we get it in our brains, right? This needs to be part of our genetic, our our DNA. This needs to be part of who you and I are. Who are we? We're people that run to Jesus. Who are we? We're people that don't turn our, close our eyes to the cross. I'm a man of grace. I stand before you today because of grace. You are my brothers. You are my sisters in Jesus Christ because of grace. The Barnes Commentary puts it this way. It's kind of difficult writing, but listen. Here... It evidently means no other change than that produced by the horrors of a guilty conscience. Uh, all all uh, Judas had was horrors, the horrors, possibly demonic, of a guilty conscience. And by deep remorse for crime and all of its unexpected results, it was not saving repentance that leads to a holy life. This led to an instance, in, increase in crime. It in, eventually ended in his own death. True repentance leads the sinner to the Savior. This led away from the Savior to the gallows. Judas, if he had been true, a true penitent, would have come to them, would have come then to Jesus, confessed his crime at his feet, and sought pardon there. But overwhelmed with remorse and the conviction of vast guilt, he was not willing to come into his presence and added to the crime of a traitor, that of a self-murderer. Brothers and sisters, don't murder yourself. I'm not talking about just suicide. I'm talking about emotional suicide. I'm talking about mentally berating yourself all the time. Run to Jesus. He loves you. He already sees you at your worst. He knows you better than you know yourself, and he longs to embrace you. And it's going to be okay. We have the end of the story. It's going to be okay. And the Bible tells us in the last chapter of the Bible that he is going to be our God, and he's going to wipe every tear from our eyes. It's not going to end the way it is now. The darkness you see around you is not the end of the story. Brothers and sisters, let's walk in that joy. Let's walk in that hope. Let's walk in that promise. God is good. Don't run away from goodness. When the light shines on us, when God is showing you you are wrong, do not make an excuse for that. Do not defend it. When, when the light shines on us, we have to stop digging a hole of rebellion There's no hope in that. We are people that run to Jesus. We are people that run to God. Stop digging the hole. Running from God is running from goodness itself. Turning our back on Jesus is turning our back on the light of the world. Remorse, because I'm messing up my life, is not the same as repentance, where I say, okay, God, I'm going to do it your way. I'm going to do it your way, God. Everything about you is good and beautiful, and I want to be like you. One path leads to death. The other path leads to life. Acts 3.19 says, and I alluded to this earlier, repent then and turn to God so your sins may be wiped away that times of refreshing may come to the Lord. We need times of refreshing. When life is hard, when there's too much for us, when it seems overwhelming, 
We need times. Hey, Norman, how you doing, buddy? We need times of refreshing. Revelation 3, 19 and 20. Those whom I love, Jesus is speaking. Those whom I lo love, I reprove, I discipline. Did you hear that? Jesus Christ brings discipline. He reproves. He tells them that's not right. God, God, Jesus is stern with us. Those that I love, I correct. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Zealous means you're all in. I'm all in. You don't dip your feet in Christianity. You jump all in. You don't say, I'll, I'll take grace, but I'm going to beat myself up for my sin. No, I'm jumping all in grace. Let it wash over me and repent. And then Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He says, look it, I'm right here. I'm knocking on your door. If anyone hears my voice, open up the door. Can you hear God? Can you hear Jesus pleading with us? Open up that door. I will come in and I will dine with you and you with me. Let's do life together. Now this verse, sometimes we used to talk to non-Christians and say, look it, God's right there. He wants in. But when Jesus spoke this, and I think that's okay. That's okay. But when Jesus spoke this, he was speaking to a church. Even in church, we can close our hearts off to God. We can get hard-headed. We can get stubborn. We can start to wallow in bitterness and pouting. We can, we can be filled with the darkness instead of being filled with the light. And Jesus says, listen, I'm right here. Just open up that door. Let me back in. Let's do life together. Let's walk together. Let's sleep together. Let's, let's uh, eat together. Everything about you, I want to be with you 24-7. That's the God we have. And he sees us at our worst, and he loves you, and he doesn't want to throw you away. Brothers, sisters, Jesus wouldn't have died for garbage. He wants to be with you forever. And he knows you. He still wants to be with you forever. When the darkness closes in on us, where are we going to run? We're going to run to Jesus. We've got to do that better. Where are we going to run? Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.